Well, we're continuing in Revelation. This is part two. Uh, I got to tell you, originally we were going to spend one week in the seven churches. Uh, however, I'm just too long winded of a preacher to pull that off. As first service made plain. So probably we're going to spend this week and next in these two chapters. So, Revelation chapter 2 this week. Go ahead and turn there and put your finger there for just a moment as we review a few things. In chapter 1, as we studied last week, it gave a glorious introduction to the Revelation the doxology, the opening vision of Christ with his hair white as snow. And like pure wool, a robe of a high priest, eyes of flaming fire, his face shining like the sun in all its brilliance, seven golden lampstands, seven stars, and more. When we get into chapter 4, we're going to continue on with real strong and uh, interesting uh, imagery where John is being shown the spirit realm and having to write, write it down in words that we can understand in our language, uh, and obviously the language of his time translated to us now. But chapters 2 and 3 is more so plain language that we can understand and straightforward because it's written for a now time versus the future tense. And I'll explain what I mean in that in just a minute. Chapters 2 and 3 are not fantastical in nature. Um, most of these things we can understand ourselves, but we dare not gloss over chapters 2 and 3. Uh, to do this would miss the whole point of the book. Uh, the book was written to the churches, and the book was written to prepare the churches for the things that would take place after this. As it says, but remember what Revelation 1.19 says, it says, Write therefore the things that you have seen, those that are. And these two chapters are the things at that time that are. Does that make sense? That was in the moment what was happening then. And then it says, and those that are to take place after this. So they were addressing the churches as they were to prepare them for what was to be. Okay, what was to come. John's urgency is clear in these chapters. Some of these issues that... John addresses here, of course, Jesus giving him the revelation that John is writing down, so it's the words of Jesus, but some of the issues of these churches make John not at all certain that God's people are ready for the great onslaught and challenge that lays before them that will come upon them. For years, to be very honest, I have very much so shared this concern as well, uh, that we are just not ready. The church has not been ready for persecution. The church has not been ready for tribulation. The church has not been ready for the things that are to take place after this. We must be ready to stay faithful to Christ and his word. Jesus, the living Christ, if you remember from chapter 1, is walking amongst the seven lampstands and he assesses the condition of each church. However, Jesus also expects that each of the seven churches will not only be told about their own condition, but they will hear about the conditions of the other churches, not for gossip's sake, not to compare and say, oh, we're better than them at least, but to know well, we need to also be forewarned about what they're being forewarned about. Remember what it says at the end of each letter to the churches. It says what the Spirit says to the churches. And so obviously then it still applies for us today. We need to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Now we're only going to take this week and next week, I said, to study to do so from a high level, overseeing it, and even still doing, even so taking two weeks, to be honest. There are some parts I just have to skip over that I would love to explain and take time uh, but I, I want to try to give what I feel the Spirit is saying, what the message is of how we need to prepare, rather than just some details of what the text means, which I love to do, but I'm trying to obey the Spirit here. But there is a pattern for each letter to the seven churches, so we'll, we'll notice this as we go through. First of all, Christ is introduced consistently with the phrase, these are the words of, and then individual descriptions are given based on the description we saw and studied last week out of chapter 1. Then uh, uh, it's followed by words of praise for each church and how they're doing, the things they're doing well, except for a couple churches. One church has nothing good said about it. That's bad. One church basically says, you're all bad, except a few of you. There's a few of you that are doing all right. That's it. But then come the warnings, what each church needs to repent of and correct before the events of Revelation are to take place after this. Next, there is a concluding word of admonition Finally, there is a promise given. Now, over the years, as I mentioned last week, uh, just to reference it again here to make sure everybody understands, over the years, some preachers and scholars have hypothesized that these seven churches represent the different ages of the church throughout its 2,000-year history. Uh, I just don't think that can be true because at any given point in time, you're going to have Christians who are doing well and being faithful and Christians who are not. So during the church age where no one is doing well, you, there's, of course, some who were always, there's always been a remnant. So it doesn't really fit. I think it's just assessing kind of the condition of all Christians at all times. 
But it's written to these seven specific churches of that time, but it's all applicable to us now. Hopefully that makes sense. But these letters are best understood as an encouragement and warning for all believers. An encouragement and a warning. He tells them the things you're doing well, encouragement, and a warning, the things you need to repent of. As we read these descriptions, I encourage you all as strongly as I can right now, even to yourself and to the Lord, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you where you are in these lampstands. As Jesus is assessing his church, how is Jesus assessing you? And for me, how is he assessing me? What are the things that you are being affirmed for doing well? Hear the encouragement of the Lord today. It's not all doom and gloom. But what are the things the Spirit is showing you that you need to repent of so you are prepared for the return of Christ and the things that are to take place? So we're going to go through each church at a time rather than reading all the chapter at once and then breaking down. Let's go to the church of Ephesus first, beginning in chapter 2, verse 1. Whoever it is, they're ready now. Did you all feel that, hear that? Okay, sorry. I guess none of you guys cared like I did. Like, what was that? To the church... To the angel of the church in Ephesus, now let's pause there real quick. Remember in chapter 1, Jesus said he's the one that holds the seven stars in his hands, and the seven stars are the seven angels of the churches. So that's what he's saying here. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first, or as some translations put it, you have abandoned your first love. No, not your first love back from junior high, okay? Verse 5, remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent, And do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. No longer a church. Unless you repent. Yet this you have. You hate the work of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And you will hear that repeated at the end of every letter to each church, to the one who conquers, to the one who conquers. It's not going to be weak, pathetic Christians that make it across the finish line. Oh, I'm out then, pastor. I feel weak and pathetic. Don't stay that way. You're choosing to stay that way. Are you really going to sit here and tell me, maybe none of you are, but let's address it just in case. You're really going to sit here and tell me that that's what you are, you're a weak, pathetic Christian when you have the Holy Spirit inside you? When the Word of God itself says you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Don't tell me you're weak and pathetic and you can't do it. Yes, you can. Quit cooperating with the devil. There was commendations given to this church. Jesus said, I know your works, your toil. Hard labor. Your patient endurance. That you cannot bear with evil. We're living in a time when we are tolerating evil. We're bearing it. The commendation to them was, you do not bear with evil. You won't put up with it. So I'm going to be real strong today because it's a warning to the church. And we live in a time where if you would actually dare think that we don't need to hear this, then you're not paying attention to our world. Some things have happened for so long we've just gotten used to them. My friends... Abortion is evil. Evil. It's not a choice. It's not health care. Nor 
in any way, shape, or form, is it reproductive justice? It's evil. Now, please hear my heart. If that is in your past, give it to Jesus. And if you already have, do not forget Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Your sins have been washed in the blood of Christ just like my sins have been washed in the blood of Christ. But I know so many preachers who will not address the evil because they don't want anybody in their church to be hurt. These things should actually just keep us humble before the Lord. To say, Jesus, I can't believe you loved me that much. But he does. Remember how God demonstrates his love for you. Not just tells you, he demonstrates it in the fact that this, while we were still sinners, Christ died. God loves you that much. Don't walk out of here thinking you are condemned. You are not if you have given your life to Christ. But since 1972, we've tolerated it. We have voted for it. We have funded it. Well, what can I do about it? I mean, we're tolerating it. The church in Ephesus would not tolerate evil. They would not bear with it. Maybe you and I don't have the power to directly ourselves make the change, but we can hit our knees and cry out to God, number one, and then number two, get educated, and if we need to get out of the phone and spend time and actually stand up and speak out against evil. And now, proclaimed two weeks ago, in the Democratic Convention, full-term abortion. Discussed last year that it came out about potentially having an abortion once a child is born. I know this is hard. It's uncomfortable. We don't want to be forced to deal with it. But see, if we turn a blind eye and turn a deaf ear, that's how we tolerate it. I was so thankful this week at the Republican convention. I'm not saying, oh, Republicans are the heroes. But I'm just stating facts, everybody, okay? You don't like the facts? Don't talk to me. I didn't create the facts. I just report the facts. Abby Johnson, a former Planned Parenthood director, stood up there boldly and told the world what happens in an abortion. Praise God. That nun, I can't think of the right word to say that nun, that, she's a bad dude. (laughs) Colonel in the army, she called it out for being evil and said Jesus would never tolerate that. She's right. Well, how do you know? Because the one that created that life was God, and you're killing what God created. We have people that we love, family members and friends, who live a completely ungodly, and I'm going to be straight, unnatural lifestyle. And because we have people that we love that are that way, we start sliding our feelings and tolerating it and saying, well, and we start trying to find reasons to justify why it's not sin. Friends, the Bible could not be, and I mean this literally, could not be any clearer that it is a sin, homosexuality. Now the push for transgenderism that's been on for the last four or five, uh, no, even more than that now, eight years. 
The Bible says male and female, he created them. Amen. By the way, if you're not really into God and only actually into true science, you should believe this too. Yeah. XX or XY. Yeah. That's your chromosomes. I'm not trying to be uncaring or unloving. If you know me, I have compassion on people who are that trapped by Satan and sin. But because it's avalanche in our culture and it's in our movies and television shows and music and all these things, we tolerate it. In addition to this, the Ephesians tested apostles to whether they were true or not. Anybody can give themselves any label they want. You can buy sound equipment and create your own podcast. You can buy a phone and create your own videos and put them on YouTube. You can go through a server. You can create your own website. It doesn't mean you're legitimately teaching the Word of God. And the Ephesians found out whether someone was legit or not. They didn't just swallow everything from everybody. They endured for the name of Christ and they did not grow weary. Friends, this is not the hour to grow weary. I know I keep saying this a lot. It's never the hour, but man, it's, we're sure aware that right now is not the time. You know how sometimes you were in your house being raised by your mama, and you acted the same way you did everybody, but there were certain days it was not today. <laughs> right? And then dad comes along and goes, not today. Would you just shut up right now? I'm going to get in trouble. Don't just don't go away. Go outside. So you used to be able to send kids outside and just say, go, just get outside, go, just go outside, go away. You don't know about just going outside anymore. We're afraid something's going to happen, just get, go outside, go, go. Anybody remember that? Some of you are like, what's he talking about? It sounds so harsh. It was awesome. It's like, woo, freedom, dad said, get out of the house. This is not the time to be playing games with God. It's not the time to grow weary. We have to stay faithful. We have to stay engaged. We have a million things at our fingertips to distract us. And we just want to escape and be distracted. And I get we need, at times, downtime. We need to rest so we can recharge our batteries. That God designed us that way. That's different. But oftentimes we're just trying to escape or distract when we need to engage and advance. But this church, for all of its amazing things, so many great things said about it, it had a charge against it. It had lost its first love. What does it mean to lose your first love? It means things like this, that you're serving in church, you're working. He says, I know your toil, your hard work. You don't stand for evil, you endure patiently, but there's something missing, one key ingredient. You're doing all the right things, but for none of the right reasons. Is your heart in it? Is your heart in it? Hey, I know. It gets hard to serve Christ sometimes. Believe it or not, there's days I don't want to be here doing this. Today's one of them, I'm good. I mean, today's not one of them. I like being here today. But there's some, some Sundays where it's like, I just I don't want to do it today. But guess what I'm here doing? Doing it. It gets hard to stay faithful, to endure, to not grow weary. But when we let ourselves grow weary, sometimes we keep doing it out of obligation. Not out of a fresh heart that you're so loving God that you're willing to do anything. Remember how you felt when you first got saved, when you realized all your sins were forgiven. Amen. How you'd worship, how you'd serve. I can't tell you over the years of pastoring how many people, I can't tell you, how many people have come and said, Pastor, I'll do anything, just let me know. So you wait for the right time or look for the right spot, whatever, and then you say, hey, can you do this? Ooh. I 
me, not that. You know, if I could be so bold, I would say to the person, when you said, Pastor, I'll do anything, let me know. Did you think the first thing I was going to do was hand you a mic? Because that's the feeling I get sometimes, if I can be honest. Been there, done that. I'm telling you. When going to church becomes a chore, and you come grumbling, again, we all have bad days, everybody. And on those bad days, God bless you for being faithful. But if a bad day turns into a bad month, and a bad month turns into a bad year, and a bad year turns into a bad season, it's your bad life. (laughs) It's a bad life, I'll say. And eventually you'll fade away. Let us be like Psalm 122 that says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. You can't wait for Sunday. And straight up, the last several weeks in here, you should not be waiting for Sunday. It's been so good in this place. You guys online, I don't know how you're doing it. Because I, I wouldn't do it. That's why I'm here. It's been so good. The presence of God, the worship, his spirit in the house, the moving, the fellowship, the love, the peace, the joy, the hope. It's been so powerful in this place. I'm glad when they say, let us go to the house of the Lord. And if you really are not losing your first love, you're actually mad that you only get to come right now once a week. You know, I love it. Jesus. And I really miss it right now. I love it when parents come and tell me how excited their kids are to come to church. Is it church day? Is it church day? Parents tell me they drive by and they see the building and kids are like, oh, are we going to go to church? And it's a Thursday. That's first love. That's how we're supposed to be. You realize how blessed we are to get to do this? We're kind of getting a reminder right now, aren't we? And as Pastor Robert Morris once said, it never left me and it guides me now and stays with me. And I think of the term, he said, I never got over being saved. It makes me think of Romans chapter 7. Years ago when I really got into a deep study of Romans, I identified with those words that Paul wrote so much. And he described our dual nature of being saved and having the Spirit of God with us, but having this flesh we still live in. And he said, the wrong that I know I shouldn't do, I keep on doing. The thing I should do, I don't do. And you can hear the pain of someone who wants to live a life pleasing to God, but is so fed up with his own flesh. And you can feel the hopelessness start to sink in the words. And yet it ends with hope. Because he says, who will save me from this wretched body of death? And then answers it, thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Don't let the enemy keep you in condemnation. There's times I just think, God, I wish I could do better. I wish this. There's times I feel, and I'll I'll go back to verse. Who will save me from this wretched body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus. If you never get over being saved, you'll never lose your first love. Years ago, I had someone ask me, after hearing a lot of the things I've been through in church and ministry and being a pastor and backstabbings and chest stabbings, eyeball gouging, they said, how did you forgive those people? 
after they hurt you? And I said, it's easy. Because I hurt Jesus. I pierced his hands. I pierced his feet to the cross. It was my sin that forced a crown of thorns into his head. I beat him up. I plucked his beard from his face. I spat on him. Did I do those things physically? Of course not. But it was my sin that led Jesus to willingly endure all of that because he loves me. That's my response. We'll never be anything else of other than this. Lord, what do you need me to do? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You need me to do that? Yes, sir. You want me to go here? I'll go there. You want me to do this? Yes. All right. Yes, sir. I don't ever want to get over my first love. And then the warning, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. In this next season of our church, I'm going to need you to step up. And to say it very bluntly, whether you want to or not. I met with the board this week. We want to start taking steps back to normalcy as a church. We've already taken some. They'll be small. They'll be spirit-led. As I feel the spirit release, say, go ahead and do this. Go ahead and do this. But we're not functioning normally as a church right now. You know that. We're not doing all the things we used to do. And I don't mean we're trying to go back in two weeks because we can't. We don't have the same people in place. Some need to stay home. They have an autoimmune deficiency or their age or things like that or just different scenarios that are going on. But if all of us have the first love in here, yes, sir. And it won't be forever. It's not a trick or deception to get you into something for 10 years, but we need to rally together to get our church moving, getting back to being the church God wants us to be. doing all we can to make disciples, to reach the lost, to serve our community and develop leaders. Next to the church in Smyrna, starting in verse 8. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are of a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear for what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt, will not be hurt by the second death. The second death we'll get to towards the end of Revelation. It's eternal death, the lake of fire. Smyrna, as it's known as suffering Smyrna. And as I was given a little tidbit right after first service, I didn't preach this first service, Smyrna comes from the name of myrrh. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But myrrh has to be crushed before you get the fragrance. And it's suffering Smyrna because they were going to be crushed. You can thank my cousin Shannon for that one. Smyrna is the first of two churches that Jesus has no rebuke for. The other is Philadelphia, who we call faithful Philadelphia. He told them, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. There is a church roughly 40 miles from here right now in Pasadena, that every member who attends is under threat of arrest. Of course, along with the pastor and the board and the leaders, but they specifically named everyone who attends just for going to church. 
This is not Iran. This is not North Korea. This is not China. We used to think, ah, it's always been over there. I'll be straight, the churches I grew up in, there wasn't a lot of passion from the majority of the church for the persecuted church. Every once in a while you get a reminder, let's pray for the persecuted church. And you heard stories, but we just felt so safe and cuddly and warm in America because that's never going to happen here. If the evil that we're seeing in our streets for months now continues, and if the far left gains the power in the country that it is gaining now and seeking, persecution of the church will escalate. There is no doubt about that. It's been under the surface for years, and now it's above the surface. It's been under the surface for years under the guise of political correctness. Say anything at all against the homosexual agenda and you're canceled. Churches have sat silent on this for years, decades. Well, we don't ever want anybody to feel uncomfortable. We don't ever want anybody to feel not loved. We don't ever want anybody to feel judged. We don't want those things either. <laughs> but I don't ever want anybody to think they're not a sinner. That's why every time I talk about it, I always reference my own sin. I don't think I'm not a sinner now. I just know I'm now a sinner saved by grace. If the far left gains power in this country and persecution comes, how prepared are you to be like Smyrna? I keep getting this feeling that people think, oh, that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. And it keeps happening. It's escalating. It's growing. They're telling us. Churches across the country now that if they want to be open are being openly threatened with a press release on a press conference. It's not like some backroom thing that someone heard and a, 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 you know, someone close to a source said. No, they're saying it directly to everyone to be heard, not just we'll fine you now, we'll arrest you. They are saying, if you have a church service, we will take away your church forever and shut you down permanently. Do you think they're joking when they say that? Do you think that's just a veiled threat? Remember one of the four soils that we talked about last week, the rocky soil. People who receive the word and they receive it with joy. But as verse 21 says, yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. It also makes me think of Peter, who arrogantly proclaimed to Jesus even if they all fall away, I will never deny you. And he did it that night, three times. But how good God is. He gave Peter a second chance. Jesus resurrected, and he told the women he appeared to first at the resurrection, go tell my disciples. And Peter in front of the disciples, Peter proclaimed that he was better than all of them. And yet he blew it more than all of them. And Jesus said, tell my disciples, and he made sure to name Peter. Because that tells me guaranteed Peter was going to think, he doesn't mean me. He wouldn't want me now. You guys don't know what I did. You all heard me. But then you guys left and I denied him three times. 
I was such a coward, I denied him to a little girl. Jesus doesn't want me anymore. How could he? No, Jesus said, you tell my disciples and you tell Peter. Whoever you are this morning, I don't know who this is for, I did not speak this in the first service. If you think you've messed up too much, if you think you've hurt God, you've rejected, you've messed up too many times, no, hear him say your name. He says, Jeremy, you tell Connection Church and you tell and fill your name in. And after seeing the resurrected Christ and being filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, Peter was faithful to the word of God and to Christ until he was martyred. And here he said, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. Rich spiritually, of course. This could be true of some in America, no doubt, but in the world standards, or by the world standards, most of us are very rich. But he tells them, I know your poverty. But I want to bring this up for one simple point, and I'm asking you to hear this as a good self-assessment question. And only you can answer it, and only the God knows if you're telling the truth. Are you more concerned with being materially rich or being spiritually rich? Are you more concerned with being materially rich or spiritually rich? <laughs> I crack up here sometimes because you guys don't know how the spirits lead me. Sometimes I'm like, oh, Lord, you didn't tell me before, but I know the Spirit's speaking. A good first indicator is do you tithe? If you tithe, you know, no, I'm doing this, I want spiritual blessing. I'm doing this by faith. I'm giving money away. I don't want it to come to this. I certainly don't. But we must be prepared to be faithful unto death. I was in Colorado when Columbine happened. One of the girls who was killed attended the church I was at. We heard the stories. I know it's been disputed over the years, but we knew the stories. We knew their families. They were faithful Christians. We know stories around the world of people who, in the face of death, will not deny their faith in Christ. Do you ever think about that? I mean, just do you think about it? Or do we serve God for the blessings he'll give us? God, make my life better. Lord, I need a spouse. God, I really could use a job. And God doesn't want to provide those things. But seek first. Seek first his kingdom. And his righteousness. Hang on to that for a little bit later. And then he'll add all those things. You have no good, you have no idea. Some of you do. Some of you do. But there are some here I know, you have no idea how good God wants to do for you. I just know how good he's been to me. The church in Pergamum. It's my time. Starting at verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Obviously this church had faced severe persecution and one of their own was martyred, Antipas. But I have a few things against you. You have some who hold... The teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, so they might not eat food, uh, so they would, so they might eat food, sacrificed to idols, and practice sexual immorality. A reference to an Old Testament story where an enemy of Israel knew they could not defeat Israel, and so one of their own told them, "Well, here's what you do," because he knew how God would have to judge Israel if they sinned. If you lead them and trick them into sinning then God will take care of it and you can defeat him. So a deception from the inside. So also you have some who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent. 
If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Uh, can you imagine if God gives you a stone that's so special for you, it's for no one else? A name he calls you. Wow. Their commendation was for holding fast to the name of Jesus, not denying their faith in our country, but this is even increasingly changing now. It's easier to say God, but not say Jesus. You say Jesus and things get real sticky. Oh, sure, God, oh, the big man upstairs, the higher power, the guy who is in a better place. Uh, but say Jesus. And the biblical Jesus. Not the, Jesus, what did Jesus just loved everybody? So we're just going to love everybody, meaning you're going to tolerate sin. Not that Jesus. Biblical Jesus. But the rebuke was for false teaching. Christ's reference to the sharp two-edged sword proceeding from his mouth forewarns that the church's failure to discipline false teachers will prompt him to intervene directly, make war against them. I don't want Jesus to be at war with me. That's scary. I know these are end time prophecies, I get that, but the issue at hand is false teaching. We must resist false teaching. In the day and age of the internet, satellite TV, YouTube, podcasts, and more, this is more and more dangerous because now any crazy person, or more specifically and more accurately, a false teacher, can record themselves on their phone and broadcast it to the world. And just because someone has a lot of followers doesn't mean they are a legitimate teacher of the Word of God. Popularity does not determine accuracy. That's why I tell you all the time, and I'll always tell you, don't take what I say for granted. You check it yourself. Check it yourself. Not that I think I'm teaching wrong. I'm doing my utmost to teach this well and accurately. But just because someone has a pulpit or a platform of any kind doesn't mean you should swallow what they say. You need to know the Word of God yourself. Amen. Well, Pastor, I just don't like reading. Tough! Here's Jesus walking amongst the lampstands, looking at his churches, and he comes over to where you are and says, I gave you my word. You live in America. You, you guys have a ton of Bibles. Oh, but Lord, you know, I, I don't like reading. Oh, okay. I just love everybody. Does Jesus love everybody? Yeah, that's why I paid a high price for sin. Not so we could keep on sinning. To save us from sin. To rescue us from sin. Not to indulge sin. Well, I don't understand it. Okay? I'll help you find a translation you can understand. I'll help you find a study Bible that will help you understand as you read along. It has good study notes to help explain the verses that you're reading. I love doing that. Honestly, I do. There's a good chance if you don't have a good study Bible, I'm going to buy you one if I really think you're going to read it. You need to know this word, everybody. You need to know it. When people say, I'm too busy, and then whatever they're too busy for, what they are saying is, I don't prioritize this. Stop deceiving ourselves. When you say, oh, I'm just so busy, what you are saying is, I refuse to make this a priority. Because the truth is, we all make time for whatever we want to make time for. That's why it's called priorities. You watch a three-hour sporting event, and then say you don't have time for the word? You go shopping in person or online and don't have time for the word? You spend time on social media? 
you know I could keep making lists. No matter what it is in your life, when you say, I'm too busy, you're saying, I'm not going to prioritize that. That's real. I told you today it was going to be a humdinger. So you're like, I didn't know what that meant, so I didn't really know where you are going with that, but now you do. Next time we go, no, not another humdinger. We have two powerful remedies against false teaching. One I just talked about, the Word of God. Secondly, we have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will guide you right back to the Word. Because it says in the Bible that he guides us into all truth. And he'll remind us of everything Jesus taught. So he'll take you back to the Word. One more quick thing. If you say you don't understand it, that's why you need to come to Bible studies. That's why you need to listen. That's why you come to Sunday morning. You help someone, you, you come to hear someone explain the Bible so you learn how to read it. And the last church we'll take today, the church in Thyatira. To the church in Thyatira, starting at verse 18 and 29. It's actually the longest uh, uh, letter to the churches. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write the words of the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance and that your latter works exceed the first. Sounds pretty good. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent. Let's pause there real quickly. This destroys the false argument of why would a loving God send people to hell. You can read throughout the entire Old Testament, all the way through as we're doing now in Revelation, And even as we read through Revelation, keep this in mind as you're going to see it in the last chapters of the book, towards the end of the book. God always, always gives people a chance to repent. Always. I taught in the minor prophets this year and all the doom and gloom and all the judgments and all the things that would say, unless you repent, repent. Right now, every church, I have this against you, so repent. Even Jezebel who if you know anything about the Bible, there's nothing worse in the Bible basically you can be called than Jezebel. And he says, I gave her a chance to repent. She refused to repent. And as we'll see towards the end of the book, we will see that even at the end of all things, and Jesus comes back at the second coming, people in the world will see him, and even after everything we've been through and everything the world's going to endure, they still refuse to repent, and they get angry at God. I have been, I've loved what I've seen float around this week, uh, uh, a little meme or something that's gone around as people have put a few times. God doesn't reject people and send them to hell. People reject God. God's not trying to reject you. He's trying to welcome you. He's trying to save you. He loves you. The question is, will you reject him? I gave her time to repent in verse 21, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her, I will throw into the great tribulation unless they repent of her works. There it is again. And I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each according to your works. But to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold to this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. 
Only hold fast what you have until I come. To the one who conquers and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron as when earthen pots are broken into pieces. Even as I myself have received authority from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. As Paul exhorts numerous times, I encourage all of us in 1 Corinthians 6.18, flee from sexual immorality. Flee from it. Don't flirt with it. Don't entertain it. Don't ponder on it. Certainly don't go on a date with it. If you're single, I'm not kidding. You can ask my wife. I've shared this with her. When I was single, this might, I don't know how it's going to come across. There was girls I knew, stay away from. Y'all get what I'm saying? No brakes. Some had gas pedals. I'm sorry, you could tell. And I'm not trying to say anything disparaging. I was actually trying to obey God. My favorite scripture for being single is Proverbs 4.23. Guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flows the issues of life. I even got encouraged by some Christians. He said, you should go out with her. I was like, "Uh uh-uh. Y'all don't know what I know. And I'd be bored on the weekend. And it was nice to, would have been nice to say, oh, I have a girlfriend. (laughs) I might have wanted a girlfriend, but I didn't want a baby. (laughs) Not yet anyway. Then a baby. Why? Because I was trying to flee from sexual immorality. And I'm a guy like anybody else. It's not like the temptation wasn't there. But flee is a pretty clear word. Not only does the American church have a lot of sexual immorality... But we are now listening to a lot of teaching that promotes sexual immorality, and some even call it good. What do I mean by that? I know of, and I hear this from time to time, and I don't even want to get into it because it's gossip, it doesn't matter, I just pray. And I mean it, I pray. Of churches who allow someone in an openly sinful relationship, whether it be living with someone before marriage, or homosexuality, who allow them on the worship team, who allow them to teach in kids' ministries and those kind of things. I don't mean someone with the same-sex attraction that is trying to submit that to the Lord and is living a celibate life. I don't mean that. I mean someone who's living in a purposeful, intentional, sinful life. But hey, they sure sing good or we really need that guitar player. I have found out of churches that this blew me away, I could not believe it, that many knew, well, that's the choir director. Everyone knows about him, but man, he sure can do music. We tolerate it. We allow it. We don't deal with it. And I'll tell you, as pastor, it's hard to deal with. Most times, you know when you deal with it, you're going to take some hits yourself. You could take some big hits. And 
And now we have whole denominations preaching, proclaiming that homosexuality is not only okay, they serve as pastors and bishops. It's completely endorsed. The Bible calls it an abomination. How much clearer could it be? And I'm sorry, I'm just calling things as they are because I don't have time to mess around anymore. I don't care how much you like a politician. When I heard President Obama dismiss homosexuality and say some obscure reference in Romans, it disgusted me because he was claiming Christ. And if you think I'm saying, oh, the opposite is the answer, Jesus is the answer. But I'm talking about how we've gotten to the place where we're some of the churches that Jesus is walking amongst the candlesticks and he's saying, here's what you're doing. You're tolerating sexual sin. You're listening to Jezebel. You're letting her teach you that this is okay. Oh, but they said they're a Christian. They said they're a Christian. They said it's okay. Well, did Jesus say it was okay? How are we falling for these things? Because we don't know the word. Or we're not committed to remain faithful to the word. I know this is strong. But the church in America needs to wake up and return to Christ, repent of its sin, and preach the word of God. And I'm a shouter in all things in life, so I shout. Because that's me giving it all I got. We had a big brouhaha a couple years back with a group of pastors because one pastor was coming in. Who, when he came, based on the church he came from, I knew this denomination endorses that. I will not fellowship with that. I, I can go to coffee with you. I can, I can be a friend. Jesus was a friend to sinners. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be your friend. I'll love you. Yeah. I'll hug you. Yeah. Even now with COVID, yeah. I'll hug you. Yeah. I'm a hugger. Emoji. <laughs> <laughs> Cannot believe I just did that. <laughs> the only thing I like getting more than a laugh is an Amen. So you can see, I like getting both. We're a both-and church. And this pastor came, and I knew, okay, Lord, how are we going to handle this? I went and checked out the website, and I listened to sermons, and I read things. And it was vague, but it was there. But intentionally vague. But I knew at the heart of it, no, you're saying it's fine. And you can ask my dad if you need a witness, because he was there. When it came time to talk about it and get to the nitty-gritty, because it was getting where, what are we doing here? I would not let it go. And I pressed the issue until he, and they would try, I heard all the arguments, everybody. You know what it was? Colossians 2 8, high sounding nonsense. And I pushed until I made him say, the bottom line is, do you say it is sin or not? Kept falling back on, well, why are we picking on just one sin? I said, we're not picking on just one sin, but we're calling it sin. Yeah. I didn't shout it this way. We were in a meeting. It was different. <laughs> See, the issue is he refused to call it sin. But if it's not sin, friends, then you don't need to be saved. Right. If we're not sinners, why did Jesus die? Yeah. We've gotten so far away from the gospel message and made about Jesus giving us a better life. I want Jesus to give me eternal life. That's the life I want from Jesus. And if I suffer now, if I'm ridiculed now, if I'm mocked now, I will have eternal life. And that's all I'm asking from Jesus. But we tolerate it. 
We make room for it. We excuse it, and we listen to teachers who are being Jezebel in this day and age. Hear the words of the Lord this morning. Repent. Stop sleeping with each other. Stop looking on the internet or on your phone. Stop excusing it. Now listen, hear my heart. I know you may have friends or a loved one who's caught in a lifestyle. But the old saints used to know what to do. The old saints would pray. They didn't try to excuse it. They didn't try to find a justification. Remember, the Scripture warns about in the last days people accumulating teachers to teach whatever they want to hear. Oh, but this person said it's okay. Yeah, but the Bible doesn't. And they'll twist and pervert Scripture. I've heard some doozies. Because when I hear a new argument, I read it, I read it, I wonder what are they saying? The last one I heard of you, I thought, you, what? I was just like, you, you think, you're saying what? It's not what the scripture teaches at all. If you have someone you love who's in a lifestyle that's sinful, don't excuse it. I hope you'll hear this. Pray like you're the only one who will pray them through to heaven. Pray like it's you that Jesus is depending on to pray for them. You pray. We don't know how to pray anymore. We just want God to do it quickly. And when it doesn't happen, we give up and move on, or we leave God because he didn't answer our prayer. The old saints, that I'm just old enough to have a connection to that generation, they didn't pray until they got an answer. And sometimes that meant praying for decades. But they learned. Oh, how God answers prayer. Oh, how powerful God is. If we'll just pray. It's all he's asking for. To have faith. Pray believing. And as we get some music up here to close. When it uses the phrase sexual immorality here, it's a catch-all phrase. It's the Greek word porneia, where we obviously get the word porn from. It means all manner of sexual sin. All manner of sexual sin. We're not picking on just one. But we are calling all of it sexual sin. Sexual immorality is not freedom. Freedom. It's not exploring your sexuality or just having fun. It's sin and it will destroy you. The last scripture I'll share is out of 2 Timothy 2.22 where the Apostle Paul warns a young minister named Timothy and he says, run from anything that stimulates youthful lust. There it is again, flee. Flee. Run. Run from anything that stimulates youthful lust. Instead, pursue righteous living. Pursue it. You have to pursue righteousness. You have to go after it. You have to prioritize it. You have to pray about it. You have to surround yourself with other people who will encourage your righteous living and hold you accountable when you're trying not to pursue righteousness. Pursue righteous living. Faithfulness. Love and peace. Enjoy the companionship of those 
who call on the Lord with pure hearts. And this is why I will say again, we need to gear back up as a church. As my nephew so anointedly, I don't know if that's a word, (laughs) preached a few years back in this house, church is so much more than coming to a service. And yet oftentimes that's the extent of our participation with the church. It's why right now, in this season, I can't just accept five months later to just have service on Sunday. Although, as I said, we've been having service, man. We've been having services. Woo! Christians have to be together to pursue righteous living together. If you think on Friday night you're just going to hold out, or at the end of the date, you're just going to try to make sure not sin, that won't work. You have to pursue righteousness. And a great way to do that is by getting around the companionship of all those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. I'm so thankful I grew up in church. I grew up when we went Sunday morning for Sunday school, then you went to church after that. Then you went to Sunday night, you went to Wednesday night, and any other and all other extracurricular activities. When it was Christmas cantata season, you lived at church. Can I get an amen from somebody who knows what I'm talking about? But as a teenager, I had friends at school. I played football. I hung out with the jocks. They did the parties. I didn't. By the grace of God and by very strong parents, which I say with all love and respect, I stayed away from a lot of stuff in my teenage years that I found out later on even other people who were raised in solid Christian families didn't. I wasn't perfect by any means. But I stayed out of a lot. And it was abundantly obvious to me why. Started with them. Can't tell you about all the speeches I heard about strange fire. But we were heavily involved in church. Whether it was hanging out with the youth group, doing an activity with the youth group, or serving in kids' ministry at all their special events, which I helped out at all of them, nearly. I wasn't going to parties because I was up down to the church staying up all night for the kids' ministry all nighter because I was the one who could stay up all night long. And the pastor said, I'm going to go home for a little bit. You're in charge. All right. I was enjoying the companionship of all those who call on the Lord with a pure heart. We are made for fellowship. We're not made just to come sit in church, walk out and leave. We're made to live life together. Read through this New Testament. It's abundantly clear. If you need some scriptures to start with, uh, send me an email during the week and I'll email you some text scriptures to read it. And I'm feeling now more than ever the church has got to start getting together. I've always felt this, of course. I've always known what the Bible says, but with persecution rising, we have to stand together. It's so hard for me as a pastor when I see someone, that one sheep of the hundred, who leaves sometimes it's the same person that leaves over and over and you do what you can to be like Jesus and go out and get that one but you can't physically pick them up and bring them back you call, you text, we as a church leadership team, I've tried to reach out to so and so, have you heard from me? I haven't heard because I know what the result will be 
you're going to walk away from Christ, you'll start living sinfully, and you're going to end back up in the same mess you were the last time you did this. Which then it got so bad, you finally came back to the Lord, and you'll repeat the same cycle. And I will finish my final words with this. You need to do, and we need to do, whatever it takes to be in strong fellowship with each other. Prioritize it. Pray for it. I'm going to tell you right now, my wife met with the women's leadership team last week to talk about where do we go from here. We can't do the calendar we had set. I'm going to let you know right now. Men, we're wanting to get a new thing going for our men's ministry. The board is wiped clean. I don't even know what we're going to do yet. I don't know who's going to lead. But I'm saying now, as I've been waiting for the prompting of the Spirit to say, I didn't even share this in first service. I'm going to be setting a meeting soon. If you want to be involved, show up at the meeting. We'll give several weeks notice. Show up at the meeting. And just say, I'm here. Yes, sir. And that yes, sir, is not to me. That yes, sir, is not to me. That yes, sir, is to Jesus.